Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our first panel of the Society for Digital Mental Health's 2023 meeting. Um, my name is Stephen Schuler. I'm the secretary for the Society of Digital Mental Health, and I'm really excited to moderate this panel on integrating digital mental health into healthcare systems. Um, we have a couple panelists, um, a few that are running late, um, but I'll start by introducing our panelists that are here. Um, and then we're going to jump in for with some questions that um, I've prepared, and we're also looking for audience questions. So feel free to put your questions into the Q&A or the chat, and I'll moderate them as we're going through um, the questions for our distinguished panelists here. Um, so the first of our panelists is Su Jon Yoon. Um, Su Jong is the Senior Implementation Scientist at Reliant Medical Group, um, Optum Care, and a lecturer at Harvard Medical School. Um, her clinical research program focuses, in, focuses on addressing the access to care problem and health disparities that exist in mental health um, and disproportionately impact underserved populations. She has extensive experience in developing innovative pathways to increase access to evidence-based interventions in mental health, including working with paraprofessionals as a novel workforce and delivering evidence-based practices, as well as leveraging technology and implementation science. Um, welcome so much. Um, our next panelist is Trina Histon. Um, Trina is the Vice President of Clinical Product Strategy at Wobot and works to integrate Wobot's capabilities into care pathways and advance the software transformation of psychiatry, behavioral health, and primary care. Trina's expertise in embedding and deploying digital health solutions in care delivery spans more than two decades. Um, prior to joining Wobot Health, Trina was a senior principal consultant in Kaiser Permanente's Care Management Institute. In that position, Trina helped shape the strategic direction, management, and performance of wellness and prevention activities and also led efforts to build, test, and scale a digital mental health ecosystem across all of Kaiser Permanente's markets. Trina has been working in the digital space since 2010 and is the author of dozens of scientific papers focused on prevention and wellness, including a recent case study in the New England Journal of Medicine's Catalyst. Um, Trina holds a doctorate in health psychology and a bachelor's degree in applied psychology from the University College Cork in Ireland. Thank you so much for joining us, um, both Trina and um, Su Jun. Um, Maybe we can just like jump into some some questions, some things I'd be curious about. Um, there's huge challenges to uptake um, and use of digital mental health services in healthcare settings. Um, what do you see as some of the the biggest challenges that you guys have encountered in some of the work that you've done? Maybe we'll start with uh, Trina. Sure. Thanks, and and uh, thanks for having me here. It's great to be here for this great conversation. Um, you know, I would say um, one of the challenges is the context in which digital mental health solutions are deployed, um, and there are a myriad of ways to approach that. So I think about primary care specifically. Um, the average primary care doctor might have about seventeen minutes with a patient. And in that 17 minutes, they're covering about five topics in, in the reason for visits. So um, you are then um, wanting to sort of embed um, deeply into that visit between patient and, and doctor. And that could be post-pandemic. It could be face-to-face -face care. It could be hybrid care. And so how... Um, how easy is it for that doctor to make that referral to the patient and how personalized is the referral? Um, and then um, the specificity of use as well is another important thing in my experience that um, if, if it's like, here's something that might help you and you can use it whenever you want to, uh, patients, again, in, in, in prior experience I've had, they like the specificity. Um, so, so that's really, really important, um, you know, augmenting care. Um, in a primary care setting, whether it's somebody on a wait list, maybe they're getting referral to specialty, but they might have to wait a couple of weeks to get in there. They might be a new med start and they're not really wanting therapy right away, but you know, a digital mental health solution like Wobot Health could be a good addition to a plan of care. So there, there is a sort of a tailoring of need um, in a primary care setting that um, needs to be understood. And so in, in my experience, leveraging human-centered design to deeply understand how is the doctor spending time? And also, of course, um, is the patient ready to receive uh, that, um, that referral? And, and how easy have you made it for the doctor to make the referral? And how easy have you made it for the patient to receive the referral? How's it going to fit into their day-to-day -day life? So, so context um, is so, so important because you've could have the best app in the world, but if it's not easy to get in somebody's hands, um, that is hugely challenging. Thank you so much. Um, Su Zhang, maybe same question. What are some of the challenges that you've seen in some of the settings that you've been working with? Uh, Trina, I love that you're just 
I'll kick this off this way because I share and echo all of the concerns that you raised and all the things that we should be thinking about as we're um, bringing in digital innovations to healthcare settings. I think the additional piece that I would like to highlight, even as you're marking all of the journey points, right from mm -hmm. a patient's perspective, like meeting with a primary care in the example that you were giving, um, what is the digital tool that the, the, and how is it going to be given to the patient? I think the, the next step in the patient journey that we think about a lot is how does then that translation happen to the patient taking the digital tool, whatever that may be, referral may be. And then what are the setups that are needed in order for the patient to actually use it? Because again, mm -hmm. all of us here are very, very aware of the fact that there's so many digital tools out there in the world and actually engagement is a humongous barrier. So what are different facilitators that we can put in place to actually make this referral transition feel like I am actually receiving care that I expect from my healthcare provider because of my relationship, my trust with them, and as they're giving me something new to try for me to address, in this case, my mental health, what, what can I have in place to help me support and make this jump? Um, especially in the case of um, using a digital tool to address my behavioral health care needs. Mm -hmm. So for example, some of the stuff that we've done um, and we're testing out is, yes, we're leveraging digital app tools, but we still can't forget the humanness. And that's what makes okay. all of us people and um how do we then integrate in a st strategic manner a different human person and touch that can really create this human connection as part of the patient's journey in accepting this innovation and actually trying it for their own improvement um, and healthcare needs? And we found that even having someone that can be available after the referral has been made to help the patient register ask a few more questions because to Trina's point, my meeting with my primary care physician covered 20 things. We had seven mm -hmm. minutes and this was one of them. So I have a few more questions that I want to address as part of my, hey, they refer me to this digital tool. How do I get to it? What does it mean? How do I navigate to it? How do I use it for myself in a way that is actually going to be attentive to my reality, my context, my day-to-day, -day, my needs? And um, even having a one-minute conversation, hey, are you all set up, ready to go? You feel comfortable? Great to a 30 minute conversation to where's my Wi-Fi? How do I find that password to get connected and then really start the journey for myself? Um, seems to really show that can make a huge difference in getting patients engaged to these digital tools. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have our next panelist here, uh, Dr. Robert um, Accordino. Um, Dr. Accordino is a board certified psychiatrist with clinical expertise in child, adolescent, and adult pharmacology, child and adolescent and adult psychodynamic and cognitive behavioral therapy, and other types of interventions for broad populations. Um, Dr. Accordino is a physician executive and a passionate champion of mental health parity, currently serving on the faculty for Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, he served as the chief medical officer of On Track Health the Chief Mental Health Officer of Quartet Health, and the Chief Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at Caremore Health System. In 2016, he was appointed to President Barack Obama's um, White House Fellowship, a year-long nonpartisan program um, founded in 1964 by Lyndon Johnson to for foster public service and leadership development. In this capacity, he advised the Secretaries of Defense of the Obama and Trump administrations on healthcare delivery technology and payment innovation, for service members and his family, uh, service members and their families. Um, so, Dr. Arcadino, maybe same question to you: challenges that you've seen, um, login problems, maybe being one of them, as we try to see these technologies. Um, but you know, can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges you've seen and some of the work that you've done? Well, Stephen, thank you for the kind introduction and wonderful to be with you all today. Sorry for the. It's actually very meta because um, as I was experiencing login problems to get into the Zoom, um, I, I think the utilization of these technologies is contingent upon the ease of their use. And I apologize if others have already said that uh, in my missing uh, their comments, which I regret. Um, but I, I think, you know, when you have physicians who are retiring early because of EHR implementation programs? Um, you know the the number of new logins when you're debuting a new technology. The the you will be paid dividends if there is an ease of access from one 
uh, technology to another. So it doesn't, so it feels like a cohesive experience as you innovate. Um, and I think what I just experienced in trying to get on was an example of that, that there was sort of like Zoom, uh, Zoom conflicts of getting into this Zoom um, at, with the email address that I was registered for the conference versus the email address that is my Zoom email address. And I didn't fully understand that. But I bring this up because these are the sorts of things that in clinical practice we encounter day to day. And you just sort of give up and come up with manual ways to sort of work around what needs to happen. And what can be a totally pristine technology that could be super helpful, docs don't even have access to because they can't get to it or because it's so clunky um, in, in, um, in, in attempting to interface with it. So uh, I, I'm, I was in an in vivo experiment of that this morning. Yeah, and I, I really appreciate those points, um, Robert. I think I, I've definitely noticed this in some of the work that I've done that a lot of times these companies don't often understand clinician workflows or training or competencies. And so it could be a really fantastic solution that doesn't completely understand the context. I think that harkens back to some of the things that our keynote speaker, um, Cynthia Sweet Castro, is mentioning about the need to break down some of these um, sandboxes um, to get people working together so they appreciate these things. Um, so we have our last panelist in here as well, um, Ava. So the Gethi, um, Dr. Said the Gethi is the Lewis C. Orr Endowed Chair in Pediatric Psychiatry and the Director of Behavioral Health Service Line at Akron Children's Hospital, adjunct professor of psychiatry and medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, she specializes in combining behavioral techniques, digital behavioral tools, hypnosis, and pharmaceutical interventions to manage mental health disorders, trauma, and chronic pain. At the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, she was involved with vetting and scientifically testing behavioral health technology in real world settings, showing that a digital cognitive behavioral therapy program is effective in improving clinical and medical utilization outcomes. She's become a clinical innovator, setting up behavioral health clinics with health technology embedded in specialty clinics, which she will continue to do in a recently appointed leadership position at Akron Children's Hospital. Thank you so much for joining us. And same question to you, Dr. Siddhik Gethi. Um, what are some of the challenges that you've seen in your own work about trying to integrate some of these tools into various healthcare settings? So like Robert, I had my own challenge getting in today, but I'm glad to be here. So thank you for having me. You know, in terms of the biggest challenge, um, I really want to echo the importance of understanding the clinical workforce and workflow into which you're embedding the tool. I think at, in the same breath, emphasizing that these tools work best if they supplement, complement clinical care, not as freestanding tools. And I think that when I talk about workflow, it's yes, it's the ease of use, it's the ease of ordering the app, but it's also how are we monitoring its progress, the ease of like at UPMC, we were able to integrate some of our digital tools right into the electronic record. So we could have a digital tool tab that you could click on easy order and easy track if you wanted to see if your patient was using a mental health app and track their progress. Great, thank you. I actually wanna follow up on something you mentioned, Su Jung. Um, so you talked about some of the different things that providers are doing. I'd be curious to hear maybe your reflections first and then if any of the other panelists wanna jump in. Um, who's doing that work in these settings that you've been working with? Are you training providers to take on new roles? And if so, what has that been like? Or if not, like where are you finding some additional um, individuals in the workforce who might be able to support some of these digital tools? So a little bit of both. Um, so I think um, to echo some of the whatever was I think referencing um, as well, what we have found to be most helpful is when we truly integrate a new innovation or like a digital tool as part of existing workflows and as part of existing roles and responsibilities. So there might be, for example, conversations that we would expect either a behavioral health provider specifically to initiate as part of their care and um, expectation of their role with a patient, you're coming to see me for behavioral health needs. Here's a tool that can help you address that specific need. It's part of our schema, it's part of our conversation. We all understand that. 
Um, it might be to Trina's point earlier that you might be training primary care providers as there's mandates coming down the pipeline around screening from behavioral health that are falling in the hands of primary care physicians, where um, for us to think about where's the line of how much information is needed versus how much information is too much. And what is the really tricky balance that we're asking providers to take on as they're being asked to check off boxes of new care uh, uh, pieces of responsibility that they're putting on their plates, while also understanding this is not my role and this is as much as I can go before I have to bring in additional either behavioral health providers, experts, or to the example that I was giving earlier, um, a new role that we have created as part of a healthcare system to really just be there to support the uptake at the patient level of this new referral source. So I think it's really thinking about how um, complementarity seems to be a key um, variable here that we can think about creatively of how that can look like from different providers helping each other, from new roles that are specifically developed to support different portions of the patient's journey or the provider's journey as they're doing this kind of referrals and this integration and then really helping um, rethink rather than adding more stuff, but rethink and reshaping existing flows in a way that will make sense and not just be adding more clicks or more things or more mm -hmm. IDs or more passwords to everyone's journey. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious other, go for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, if I could add in my, my past and, and current experience, I think there are always you know, primary care doctors, behavioral health specialists who are eager to innovate. And if you start where you have an innovation mindset and you really build with, for and by the people who will be using the system, namely the clinicians and then the patients receiving that referral, um, the human centered design, um, empathy based problem solving methodology is so, so powerful and, and start small, like in, in past experience would start with about 25 providers and really learn about the referral process, what made it easy. So then you're, you're kind of building in for other peers, the ability to make that referral easy that you've really thought it through and you're not adding 12 clicks in the EMR. Um, you know, I think Robert's point is well taken that many doctors, when you say digital, they think EMR, and that hasn't always been a very positive anchor. So you really want to understand where there might be confidence or belief barriers and really bringing sort of the evidence base, but also making sure the workflows um, that you're really um, building into something that exists. And if it's sort of a new digital ecosystem that you're building, um, also really thinking about the steps of how many clicks outside the EMR or can you build it in the EMR and then making sure um, that, it, that it's easy to receive. So I have to say human centered design is incredibly powerful to make sure you're not missing the nuance in the workflow. And it will vary depending on primary care versus a therapist and specialty versus psychiatrist in terms of maybe what what version of the EMR that they have access to and being mindful about that. Um, so you're not adding more burden to, to their day. And I think tracking those metrics is mm -hmm. important. I think sometimes we <clears throat> focus too much on the clinical outcome and not on some of these process measures right. that could really help move the leap, the, that needle of acceptability with providers and with payers, actually. Ava, I love that point. I'd love to hear a little bit more from you. Like, what are your thoughts about what some of those process measures might be? Or what are some process measures that you've tracked in your own work that um, have been uh, especially useful in you gathering insights about, is it working or is it not? I would say the most powerful one to move the needle I just referred to is tracking how we improve clinic efficiency. And so we have pediatric and primary care clinics that have embedded therapists, as most of the country does. And how can we show that those therapists can actually, with the help of the right digital tools applied in the right place in a step care model of care, see more patients um, or see the patients that are using these digital tools um, for other more complicated problems. And a lot of what I've studied, I should say, is digital digital intervention for anxiety and depression. So you know, I'm speaking specifically to that point with some of the data that we gathered. Robert, is there anything you wanna add about things that you've seen in terms of clinic 
preparation that's been necessary to try to make some of these tools work. I talk a lot about sort of trying to think about, you know, good seeds and fertile soil. And I think a lot of our work traditionally has thought about the good seeds, but I think we need to think more about that fertile soil. Like what have you seen that's been necessary to make that soil more, more fertile um, in terms of thinking about these clinics? Accessible training. So you're training folks during the work day. You're not just sort of saying, you know, assigning webinars that people need to do and we'll skip through. Um, and also um, the importance of um, support uh, throughout that and the ease of support. So I've been in two hospitals during epic rollouts and, you know, there's folks in their blue vests everywhere across the hospital support you immediately with any questions in real time. Great, thanks everyone. Um, going to go in a slightly different direction now and um, I feel like this is a question I get asked a lot recently. And so now that I have four expert people, I'm going to put it on you to see your thoughts. Um, AI, chat GPT, um, you know, a, there's a lot of conversation about how this is going to change a lot of different practices. Um, how do you think about what innovations you see with the applications of AI um, in digital mental health? And, you know, one thing that I'm specifically concerned about is, you know, how do we think about embedding trust in these types of technologies when AI is involved? Um, maybe I'll start with you, Robert. You've done a lot of work in advising and in policy things. Um, what are what are your thoughts around where we see AI's application in digital mental health going, especially as we think about healthcare systems? Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential. And I think, um, you know, as, as has been discussed uh, with AI in many different arenas, there's potential and there's also cautionary tales and we need to be thoughtful about how far this technology goes. There's certainly the ability um, to, one example that immediately comes to mind, um, this is more um, machine learning algorithms, uh, but there's a um, there's a point here that I think is is relevant. Uh, machine learning algorithms to make uh, charting um, more efficient, which is something that all of us would welcome wholeheartedly. Um, the question of, and and this it becomes quite intelligent. There's an there's an element of AI in it because it's not a dictation of the therapy session or the med management session. Um, it instead will summarize appropriately. So if a patient is talking about an affair, instead of all the details of that affair, um, they, you know, it will dictate in the medical record as marital discord or something. You know, it 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 knows how to do that. And that that's those are, you know, machine learning and AI informed machine learning. Anyway, so, but all this to say. There are concerns from a legal perspective, one example of like the metadata of where the recordings of those sessions exist and what's subpoenaable. And there are other sort of risk management um, uh, and, and legal ramific ramifications of this technology that is really unexplored. So those are those are some of the points that come to mind for me. Other folks, um, how do we think about building yeah. trust in these types of technologies? Yeah, I guess uh, I work at Wobot Health, which is AI powered and NL NLP enabled. So, um, you know, I would say that, um, you know, I was struck by by Cynthia's comment about it taking 17 years to go from frontline care uh, to go from sort of evidence generation frontline care. And then we look how rapidly generative AI has captured the zeitgeist, if you will. You know, I will say that rules based AI um, are, are better suited to treatment-based protocols and also tracking for fidelity of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, I think, you know, in, in the rapidity of the rise um, of generative AI and large language models, we've seen edge cases come up very quickly in mental health. So I think um, there's, um, you know, I, I call it a prudent exuberance. So looking at where can generative AI really kind of support uh, in the increase in clinical effectiveness, I think that's the work ahead. We certainly have as scientists, the apparatus to to generate studies and look at things um, through the lenses of not just a generative in its own right, but going beyond that. Um, so I think there, the it's it's a bit early. I'll sort of uh, lean into Alison Darcy, our founders' uh, kind of philosophy that 
it's it's a bit early to say that mental health is ready for large language models, but I do feel figuring out where it can best fit, just like AI is a broader umbrella and you think about healthcare and where it might fit, um, reducing administrative burden. I'd see I've seen data that suggests it might be up to 40% of a reduction in, in, on provider shoulders for administrative burden. I think there are you know applications for it. So um so I think there you know, the future is is exciting. And, you know, we know today that rules-based um, is, is really, really uh, superior right now. And again, it's getting past all of the implementation issues that we have in digital mental health. So we have something that works really well and, and getting that to the places and spaces and to the people who need it um, versus also looking at um, the future, which, which obviously um, LLMs and generative AI is. You know, trust um, has many, many layers to it, uh, Stephen, as you talked about. you got to earn it, you got to keep it, and you got to grow it. And obviously, there are obvious mechanisms in privacy and safety and transparency. And as a user, you know, you can delete your data, for example, in mobile health. So there's all of those pieces um, that need to now become even more front and center as we're in this new era of AI and and really thinking about, well, if if I'm if I'm putting data into something, you know, how how is it being held safely? And can I can I as a user uh, de delete it over time? Um, so I think um, what what uh, generative AI and AI in general brings to the table now is more of a spotlight on all these other pieces that are super important, um, like the privacy and the security and the data use. Um, so I, I certainly welcome that. I think that also what's critical is transparency. So I think letting users know when it's a chat bot, when it's an actual human. And I think that something we haven't done enough as a field is explicitly pair those two. So if a human is still involved in some way, whether it's a coach, whether it's the clinician in the clinic, that's where the credibility and trust is anchored. <laughs> then with their transparent education of the patient, of their colleagues, that this is how I'm going to use AI. And I think, you know, we talk about this, the ability to scale more with AI, but I think another important element is the neuro-linguistic processing and the coherence it can add to the assessment process, to the match of whatever behavioral techniques you're using a digital app for to push. But so I think that if it can be thought of and moved in the direction of almost like a clinician extender, and you know, this is my executive helper, but the patient I think needing to know that the there is a human that is still involved. And, and I I mean, I hope and actually pray that we're never going to be outsmarted completely by computers. I you know that there's something about the emotional connectivity, human to human, and the way that we can, in a nuanced way, respond to the data <laughs> in front of us from a patient will not be easily replaced, no matter how good our computer models get. AI is a tool and it's human plus tool. That's, mm -hmm. I totally, um, I totally echo that sentiment as well. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. It actually makes me think about one of these questions from the q and I'll pull in here. Um, so Roger Villadarga um, asked uh, in regards to your, your sort of point, um, Ava, about clinical efficiency. Um, I sometimes worry about imposing a medical model to the work of a clinical psychologist who has a very different relationship with their patients and for whom effective progress cannot be quantified by the number of visits or progress within a session. Um, so, and I'll, I'll maybe add this on as well. You know, I give a lot of talks to folks um, in clinical psychology training programs, and I had a talk recently, and one of the trainees raised their hand afterwards and was like, everything you're sharing, Dr. Schuler, sounds really cool. I don't want to do that work. That's not what I, that's not why I came to be a clinical psychologist. How do I keep doing the work I want to do? So, you know, what are some of the thoughts that you guys have on the sort of the shifting role that professionals might have in the space as we sort of think about the appropriate integration of digital technologies and traditional clinical practice. Uh, maybe Ava, I'll start with you because it was a question kind of posed to you first around your comments around clinical efficiency. So where I think I've had a magnified 
view of this is moving from um, most of my clinical duties being from UPMC, which is a vast a system for kids and adults, to a system where I'm focused only on the mental health kids, needs of kids. And there aren't enough behavioral providers for the children. And the acuity and the volume of mental distress, pre-addiction, anxiety, depression, the things we just saw actually in the news with social media as a driver, all of that is making us all, I think, in a general way, examine our models of care. And I still think, I mean, now directly responding to the psychologist, or for that matter, for the psychiatrists out there, or really any category of therapists, I think operating at the top of our license, so being the one that, that is integrally involved in the assessment and formulation. So, you know, we can use digital tools to do checklists for us, to gather information for us. But if we can be involved with the putting that, how that is synthesized and how it is communicated to patients, parents, in my case, I think that's where we're operating sort of at the top of our license and intervening with certain complexity or when things aren't going well. So being there to monitor. And I think what we have to do, though, is all figure out how can we all practice in more population health friendly terms, because there's never going to be enough of us. And so change is hard. The status quo is the hardest thing to change. But I think that the need demand doesn't look like it's decreasing. So it really is a incumbent upon us to see, you know, what can we keep that's unique, but be become as a field open-minded to how technology can enhance our ability to do what we want to do, but we can't do, I don't think we have the luxury to do it all anymore. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, Su Jong, I'd be curious, um, given the work that you've done in task shifting, as well as, you know, thinking about the provider point of views, um, maybe some of your thoughts on the way that these technologies might change the types of practices of providers and any observations you've had on, you know, providers views, positive or negative about those changing practices. Um, I, I'm not sure much more, more I can add to everything that everyone is saying, because I agree with everything. I think um, the nice side effect, ideally, that we're all aiming for, if we are able to say that, is that the integration and availability of these new tools will allow us to be more flexible, more flexible with the what of what it is that we're providing. So whether it is like treatment, whether it's prevention, whether it's like a crisis response, like whatever the what is that we're providing, as well as flexibi flexibility around the who <coughs> can be the one delivering this different what components. So whether that be a clinical psychologist, a psychiatrist, a nurse practitioner, maybe is someone that is a paraprofessional that has been trained with different components of the what. Um, maybe is integrating our digital tools to, like everyone is saying here, to be uh, providing a supportive role to the different models of care and treatment options that we're providing to our patients and to each other at different times. Um, so I think I don't have all the answers around like, well, this is the best new suggestion that we should all be moving forward to as a healthcare system. But I think it's in a very exciting times that we're at because it's really for better or worse, shaking our understanding around like, what are we all capable and really good at doing? For example, that human connection, that human relationship, that trust that we place on an inherent human person just because they're my provider, they're my person that I'm going to, to receive care, that inherently I'm coming into this relationship with a different mindset. And then that puts me also in a place where I'm possibly more accepting of different recommendations and information that is coming my way. So entrusting humans also to think about that relationship and how can we leverage that relationship in a different way with, and being empowered with different what components within our repertoire and thinking about how can, in this case, to what we we're discussing early, either digital tools in general or AI or anything that is advanced that way to be supportive in guiding also us in 
uh, knowing what are our limitations. There's ample data out there to show that humans and providers, we're not very good at knowing when things are not going very well. And when things are, you know, two, three sessions ahead of us suggesting, hey, you might want to like start switching things up right now because at the rate that you're going, your patient might not be improving in the way that you're hoping that they will. So there's different ways that we can leverage even, you know, micro moments or session level or interventions or tools or what it is that we want to bring adjunctively to the model of care that we provide, or even at the get-go suggesting, hey, Sue, so you are not the best match with this patient because of X, Y, Z. Suggest, you know, providing a referral to another colleague that might be a better match for ABC reason for this patient. So it can even, I think, help us guide our um, way that we deliver treatment, that we match our patients with uh, different providers as well, even, and understanding what are our, our strengths and what are the areas that we can continue to grow together. Yeah, that's a great Steven. jump off. Oh, go oh, ahead. I was just going to say one more thing. I absolutely agree with everything that's been said. And and it's it's time, certainly, for new models of care that really does lean into the expertise of the different clinician types because, um, you know, how a primary care doctor spends time is, is different to how a therapist will spend time um, in terms of minutes, but also um, licensure. But I will also say, um, you know, when I think about the years I had at uh, in healthcare, you know, we think about care in episodes, and I think the value of digital mental health is being a supportive layer that's always available. So if I think of, you know, with Wobot Health, about 77% of our users actually have a conversation with Wobot outside of office hours. So there's something about the episodic nature of care and then the ability of digital mental health to be part of a plan of care, again, with that trusted relationship between patient and, and, and provider, depending on who that is to be an additional support to that patient as they're going through their lives and their day. And, and I think we're still beginning the journey of co-developing what that value looks like. And I'm, I'm excited about that in the conversations that I'm having in my new role. But I think there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of development there because if the average person's waiting 11 years from symptoms to treatment, that's a long time. And then we already heard from Cynthia about the time to move science through. That's a long time. And then, Sue, so you just mentioned maybe if we knew ahead of time when somebody wasn't doing well, we could intervene sooner. So I think there's something about a calibration and, and a partnership um, on an episodic sort of model of care where there's also continuous support that we can we can certainly do more in partnership together. So I'm excited about that. And I want to jump off um, the point you just made and some of the points Sue made. So you said, you know, if there's more information we have, we might be able to intervene sooner. So there's a question in the chat um, that some of these new digital mental health technologies have created new opportunities for digital-based measurements of healthcare behavior, stress, mental health. Um, and we know that measurement-based care is an evidence-based practice that's been hard to get into a lot of places of healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on what it might take to translate some of these novel sort of digitally-based measurements into clinical care context in ways that they might have an, an impact? Well, I think some of that is already happening in pockets. So, and again, going back to adolescents and young adults, um, there's some adaptive um, computerized testing, um, David Gibbons model, where he's, a, I mean, I know that he rolled out a study at UCLA, making it available as a screening to, screening assessment for major categories of psychiatric distress for all entering freshmen in a class. So yeah, I think there are pockets of success out there. It's just not necessarily in the medical mainstream. I also think that um, we um, are starting to see more use of predictive analytics. So I know we're talking, going back and forth between assessment and interventions here, but I think, you know, machine learning was mentioned before, but, you know, predictive analytics, and I know some wonderful work, um, Dr. David Bren at UPMC for predictive analytics for suicidal behavior. Um, I've seen some really novel modeling for the prediction of adolescent addiction and pre-addiction behaviors. So I think it is educating. Um, we have to, you know, um, I think you'd mentioned, you know, starting out small and mm -hmm. making sure that we get something to work well in a small pilot, but then we need those replication studies. We need to show that when we scale it, that 
the the trends, the predictions still hold. And I, I think that's where, I mean, I think some of what we have to do as a field is get ahead of mental health crises and become better with risk and protective factors of predicting that um, mental health risk so that we can prevent it from becoming a life-changing or, or life-ending mental health crisis. Robert, I saw you nodding um, as Ava was mentioning, you know, trying to look at some pockets of places where um, this type of digital based measurement has been done. Have you seen other examples of successes or maybe, you know, rollouts of these digital based measurements that haven't gone well and maybe some lessons learned from those successes or challenges? Nope. I think at the end of the day, we need to be humble in our expectations in that as my other panelists have said, um, our intervention in mental health care is human to human interaction. And we can simulate that with, uh, or, or said another way, it's time with patients. So there's a role of technology, but I think at the end of the day, we will always be a discipline in terms of getting patients better that is contingent upon lots of in-person time with the patient. So I, I think, we need to be humble in our expectations of what and, and ethically sound in terms of what should be replaced um, by technology and where technology can be a useful tool. There's a huge role for it. And I think you need to be mindful too of triaging patients, which is a very clinical intervention of um, triaging patients to the right level of intervention. Who's appropriate for a self-help app? Who's appropriate for coaching? <laughs> Who's appro who needs therapy? Who needs psychopharmacology or more intensive wraparound services? All of these services may be tech enabled or may be full on, you know, interacting only with an app. But I think we need to be very cautious that we're helping patients to get to the right layer uh, level of intervention um, in 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 trying to help. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've seen time and time again with various companies is sometimes there's more than meets the eye, particularly in the pediatric mental health space, where there's such a crisis of resources that we sometimes don't do enough of an intake at the beginning. And then we have some, you know, teenager interacting with an app, lo and behold, is acutely suicidal. And you need to, you know, you need to have all of this in place. But that is something that could have been avoided with a more thoughtful uh, intake and triage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And I think going off of, you know, Ava mentioned some of the work they've been doing at UCLA, it makes me think of the work Michelle Krask is doing there with her stand intervention. And she's talked to me a couple of times reminding me that it's a tiered care, not a stepped care approach, which is about identifying and assessing people up front and getting them into the type of the care they need rather than, you know, giving them something low intensity and then seeing how they respond to that. So I think that your your points around assessment are some really great mm -hmm. points that um, don't get, the, the differentiation there doesn't get often made in our field as much as it perhaps should. Trina, you had something you had to add there? <clears throat> yeah, I think I'm, I'm conscious of the balance of information that a doctor or a therapist will have to look at. So I do think um, in the digital mental health space, there is a lot of data collected. And I think your, your comments on measurement-based care are well taken, but I think we're still on the journey of what data is going to be most valuable for the care team to see and, and how often. And also uh, at the same time, always the other side of the coin is what data is valuable to the user to help them be on their journey long enough so they are getting symptom reduction and they're starting to feel better. And that can be similar, but not exactly the same as the data that maybe um, a healthcare team will want to see. Um, so I, I also feel, and, and that, and I think Robert, you were you were getting here the patient matching. Um, you know, I think if if I'm thinking of digital mental health and my experience in it, you know, employer groups may have been the first to adopt these tools, and and now we're seeing more and more happening, obviously, in the pandemic and post pandemic. Um, healthcare um, in all stripes uh, beginning to embed these tools in 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 clinical care and i think um we're sort of still on the journey of figuring out um you know how best to do that how best to make the patient match how to increase clinical adoption and then also um engagement from the user perspective and i think there's tremendous you know movement happening but i but i'm struck by um it it's still uh, making that patient match um has a lot going 
beyond will somebody use an app? It's like, are they using their phone for things other than texting? Um, can you actually get the download to happen during the visit? And that takes time, right? So who's going to be best positioned to support that, whether it's digital literacy, you know, and or having a digital navigator on staff. Like these are the roles of the future that can help get all the data that's necessary for the system and the care team to look at it. And then there'll be a clear what a doctor would do, what a therapist would do um, versus someone else on the care team who might be best positioned to support that patient. So I think we're still we're still in the figuring it all out stage because it's a one to three year journey to deploy, honestly, within a health system from the first discussion to maybe when you're you're well on the road. Um, and that's not it's not a short thing. So building relationships, that's the very human side of it is so important and building trust and you know, starting small, but starting with scale in mind, because I think we've all lived through pilotitis and and we know we know what that feels like. But really, how do you start with scale in mind uh, and then and then be very um, methodical about how you do that? Well, we have about five minutes left, so I'll see if we can get through one, maybe two more questions. But speaking about this you know, challenge of pilot, uh, pilotitis, um, there's a mm -hmm. question from the audience around, you know, thinking about making sure we appreciate product market fit from the beginning. So curious if um, any of you can share some perspectives on how teams should approach establishing um, connections, buy-in, feedback from the diverse stakeholders that are necessary to make this work in healthcare settings, healthcare, academia, patients, industry teams. How do you get them all moving in the same direction? So I can tell you in a complicated system like UPMC, um, the stakeholder alignment is key. And I think sometimes we don't do take enough time early to us do our own gap analyses. So there isn't a one size fits all solution out there. I think it's looking at where do you, where can a digital mental health tool help you in your system? Where where do you have both the clinical gaps and then at the same time the um, innovation acceptance readiness? I'm going to say because I think mm -hmm. you need both. And sometimes I think we. Go after each. I mean, there's really cool, shiny objects coming in front of us like monthly. And I think sometimes we get excited without really thinking about wh what's the best starting point at your particular institution or setting. And then I think, you know, the starting the small, but I couldn't agree more about thinking scale from the get go mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, and, and setting up your implementation science accordingly. Yeah, in, in my experience, there's sort of, uh, I think it's a Duran trilogy, which is very performance improvement um, oriented. So, you know, if you're a system and you have um, other digital tools, maybe they're for cardiovascular disease or diabetes, then you're not starting from say ground zero of deploying a digital therapeutic. Um, and, and it may be a just do it and the team you configure, which should be multi-stakeholder, will look different to if you've just maybe um, deployed one in a particular disease state. And that was very um, nuanced by the, the providers who treat that particular disease state. That might be, um, you know, you need to improve and maybe expand along a continuum of bringing other stakeholders in. Um, and then there's sort of the outer rim, which can be a little chaotic, which is you haven't done it before and you're starting with one. And that's where you want to innovate. And the people you need around the table at each of those junctures, obviously, you'll always want the executive leaders there will will differ. And the, the lift at each of those points will differ also, whether it's um, testing it, but also when you get toward end stage of, you know, final contracting and data agreements. Um, so being mindful of all of those pieces. And where you sit on a continuum, if you're a health system, <clears throat> are you very experienced in deploying digital or are you just starting? And, and then if you're um, if you're in industry and you're meeting with the health system and you're their first one, that's going to be different than if they've done many. So really understanding where your starting point is to know, you know, what your GPS coordinates to get you to success and to scale will be very important. Awesome. Well, thanks. I mean, thank you to all of our panelists. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I could talk to you the entire day. And I, I'm sure, you know, I would continue to, to get new learning. So I just want to thank you for sharing all of your knowledge and your insights. Um, I did want to call out, there was one question um, asking for a brief example of rollouts that didn't go well. 
And I want to highlight we do have uh, tomorrow afternoon the sessions on challenges and lessons learned. So hopefully you'll learn more from uh, that, that session. But I just wanted to thank the panelists, um, Trina, Sue, Robert, and Ava for sharing your insights. This has been very informational and really great and just appreciate um, all the work that you've been doing to try to figure out how we actually get these tools in the hands of people who need them in these healthcare settings. Um, there's a 15 minute break right now, and then the poster sessions will start at 1 p.m. Eastern time, um, 10 a.m. Pacific, um, and you can join each of those poster tracks uh, from the, the Zoom lobby and the Zoom events. So thanks again to all our panelists. This was great, and we will see you at the Thank poster you. sessions. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Me. Great to meet everybody. Bye-bye.